did anything at all, it was probably like seven out of ten. Uh, substantially correct is ten. Uh, maybe a little little bit not right, nine. Uh, college try is eight. Um, <laughs> it's a, more of an attendance quiz. You have to be here to get it, and then you have to come here to drop it off. Um, could have used this any way you wanted. You, you know, if you wanted to give yourself a time test with it, but if you weren't ready, um, then you know you can use the book and get studying. Um, if you want a sense of this, be able to do this or ones like it without the book in about four or five minutes each. The exam of uh, uh, week, next week, Friday. We'll have probably eight of these or ten of these, and then maybe ten uh, other ones. Mm, that's my yeah, you your name. Okay, so I'm, I'm done. Uh, write those out. Um, if there's something you can't see, uh, well, I will um, uh, do your best to squint. I'll, I'll blow that up a little bit. Um, I'll blow them up one at a time. And that up in a second. Let me, uh, I'm going to do, do a couple of things from last time. Over here is the problem that we started last time. I'll talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about osmotic pressure as the last idea from, uh, are you just pulling that out now or I Okay, so can you see that okay? Are there any questions on on this thing? It's pretty elementary in my opinion. Um, uh, the way the units are going, you, I want I needed to see that on on each of those papers on the paper um, units. Um, one crummy thing about multiple choice tests is I can't you know I can't tell if you're if you're guessing or you got it. But this is what the proper answer should look like. Um, I generally, on things like this, don't grade the answer. 
I looked for all the work. You got that thing set up, it's right. This isn't a class about using a calculator. Um, let me blow that up. Are there any questions about any of these three? Um, yes. When I did this one, I got, um, I used that thing that was at my WGE in positive. And that's what I ended up with. Okay. And H was negative, so I was trying to figure it out. I don't worry about that. Yeah, let me just see. Because it threw me out because I guess the equal sign there. All right, well, that's a chemical equation. Uh, the diamond form to C to the graphite form. This is the product, and that's the reactant. Oh, yeah, it's actually built in the diamond. Uh, oh, no, it's written as product. Product, product, reactant, delta H is product minus reactant. Just kind of picking it. I just said diamond versus. Do you have it backwards then? Did you yeah. have this upside down? Well, I had a E. Yeah, it's backwards. Three, two, three, one, two, That's really three, something to be careful of. Uh, I, yeah. guess, I guess I, I would just think of... No, it's what it's written. Uh, always, always written. Reactant product. Reactant on the right, product on the left. I'm sorry, what did I just say? <laughs> uh, reactant on the left, go to product on the right. All right, so that's what I did in the first time, and that's kind of looking into it in the book, and it seemed like diamond is always a product in that sense. So uh, as written, these things are always as written. You could see that same problem backwards, then it just act, then you work it that way. It's whatever as written. Then it tells you something. That must mean that, and in fact, this is somewhat of a, of a useful lesson um, to all you diamonds are forever people. This, this equilibrium, that equilibrium constant is a, a a number bigger than one, that means that the product is favored at room temperature. That means that that, that diamond is thermodynamically unstable at, at room temperature, and it really is. Um, that, that diamond is going to go to graphite in time. Um, so how much time? Why doesn't this reaction just go then? Why, why doesn't the diamond uh, in your jewelry turn to uh, a piece of pencil lead? Uh, you know, even if you warm it up a little bit, it doesn't. Um, it's because it's kinetically not favored. Diamond, if you remember from last semester, diamond is an sp3 hybridized thing. Um, it has carbon and then their tetrahedral link to the four other carbons around it. And all those bonds are pretty nice and strong. And in order to get to the graphite structure, which is that sheet of sp2 hybridized things, like chicken wire, that you've got to break a bunch of those diamond bonds to get the graphite, which you should. That sort of means that the, that the energy to get that process going is, is way more, even though you get energy out of it. Um, so that's kind of instructive. A di uh, yeah, diamonds are not for us. Um, be able to work that forward and backward. Um, um, any issues here? This is somewhat plug and chug. Um, the, the second one. So 
you're saying that if you put one atmosphere right here, that your P1 is one atmosphere, then you would get an answer in, at, in atmospheres. Make, make sure they're the same number. Um, and so if you did put one atmosphere uh, and you got a value in atmospheres, yeah, that, that's a prop, uh, it's, a, it's the right answer. Um, just kind of realize that um, uh, that's 0.57 atmospheres is 120, 124, 120 millimeters of mercury. So yeah, atmospheres would be okay. Yeah. Um, I, on an exam, you would have a set of answers that it could be in millimeters of mercury. Just remember, just remember on that one that an atmosphere is 764, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So anybody, anybody, any more on that one? And then there's this last. Everybody okay on this one? Now, if you did these and it took you a half an hour each, well, that's not doing too good. Um, you eventually need to get into your lab, into your text, and do more like these, and get them to where you can do them without the book. Um, you may, you may look up constants and maybe the form of an equation. Um, but that's all I would expect you to have to look up, is get a reminder, you know, maybe of the 760, uh, what's R, you know, in whatever unit you need, sir. I'll put them on, if they're, if we're doing a test, and it seems like you need a constant, some like R, you know, or Avogadro's number, anything like that, I'll put the constants and stuff on the board. You know, even, even if there's some, um, I might put TV equals NRT on the board. You know, that's one that, you know, you all know not by now, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have uh, that. So you always have the time. Uh, okay, done on that one. How about taking a look at the old board here? The, these are one of my favorite problems. Um, you'll always see one of these problems on on the exams, including the final, and it's a uh, calculate a molecular weight or a molar mass from um, uh, a colligative property measurement. And here we've taken a half a gram of, the un of an unknown and put it in 50 grams of benzene, and benzene is that, and it's freezing point depression constant is that. Um, and we measure that the, t oh yeah, you talked to me, so I got it. <clears throat> um, we measure that 0 0.42 degrees C was the freezing point depression. Now, what was, what was the, the freezing point of that then would be the freezing point of pure stuff minus that, well, for this problem I just gave you the depression. If I gave you the freezing point, then you'd have to take that difference and that's it. All right. So we're going to calculate the molar mass of this unknown stuff. Um, well, let's see. First we can calculate the molality from the expression for the freezing point depression. And notice how the units work, the degree C cancel, molal comes up, and a molal then is mole of solute per kilogram of solvent. Well, you actually have the number of kilograms of solvent. The number of kilograms of solvent is 0 0.050 kilograms of solvent. So that means that if I multiply the molality, times the kilograms of the solvent A that I should get the number of moles of B. So in this mixture, there must have, there had to have been 
0.0041 moles of B. Um, so you got the number of moles of B, and you've got the fact that there's that many moles in 0.5 grams, um, and the answer And the answer is 122 grams per mole. Um, now, now, technically, you probably go like, what about significant figures? Is he going to take off for significant figures? Well, it's something to remember that technically, then, you go, you go, well, there's two significant figures, two significant figures, three significant figures. So really, you calculated something to two significant figures. So this should be 120 in lab, because lab is the place where that's really stressed. On an exam, I won't put something like, oh, one answer is 122, and the other answer is 120, and it's a sig fig test. It's not. It's, you know, I've just kind of carried the extra significant figure here. But it matters. If this is in lab, you'll get graded on significant figures. That's not so much what we're after here, but you're right, it, it's a thing we care about. Um, okay, so we're gonna finish chapter 12, um, and um, uh, Friday I'm going to bring a handout that has the exam coverage um, for the exam that's the following Friday. Uh, chapters, sections, all the problems I put on the board, I'll have a, a piece of paper with that on it. Um, uh, let's see, the following Monday I'm going to have a 30 minute quiz. That's approximately half of the hour test. It's another practice. It's going to be problems much like what's going to be for real on uh, uh, next week Friday. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about equilibrium Friday and maybe a little next week. There's some parts of chemical equilibrium in here that I just want to go over. Um, so we'll do that Friday. One thing I want to do Friday is, right now I want to hear, you've been working questions from the text. If there's any of those that have been giving you trouble or you, if, or you want me to talk about, you, I can, I can handle them Friday, um, and maybe some Monday. But if you give me problem numbers that you're working on right now, um, I can kind of work up a talk or something about it, and look at what kind of hot points that I expect on, on things like that. Um, so if, um, so, so Friday I'll take questions on problems from the text. And uh, if you give me them now, I can think about them. Um, and remember, any problem from the text, you know, you ought to be able to do in four minutes on an exam without looking up anything. That's that's our goal, right? So, are, were there any problems you want me to look at or put up on the board Friday or talk about in any detail you want? Um, tell me now, I'll look them up or, or just bring them Friday or Monday. Uh, There'll be time Wednesday. We'll have a little review session, like an in-class help session next week, Wednesday. Um, anything? All right. Um, let me. Um, last idea of, of polygonative properties, remember a polygonative property only depends on the material being there in some concentration and not its identity. Um, it really says that this stuff is sort of taking up space but not exerting any special force. And, and this idea of osmosis, as 
osmotic pressure is an example. Um, let me set let me set up um, how I uh, how we think about this. Um, osmosis osmosis is kind of a key concept in biological systems, so we'll talk about it. Um, what we have here are U, they're called U-tubes, they're glass tubes, and they might be really tall, um, but they're, they have a plug in it down here, made this way, and that plug is a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, it's some sophisticated polymer, it could be the, the intestines uh, of, a, of an animal. Things uh, pass water, but not the salt or the solute. Um, and what we do here, so what we can do here is on one side, we can put in uh, water and some molarity of, of B. And that could be salt, that could be regular salt, um, uh, sugar, something soluble, some molarity of B in there. Um, So let me kind of put those. Here's all my beads. They're just floating around. Fully dissolved. Um, on the other side, pure water. And there's no difference in level initially. Um, um, what can happen is the membrane can pass water and set this up, something happens. And um, let, let me kind of tell you what drives this. What will happen is pure water will throw, flow through the membrane and try to dilute the stuff on the left. Let me give you a, 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 reason, a reason why. And I'm going to do digression, so in your notes, here's a little subsection called Digression on Entropy. Okay? Um, remember that S is proportional to the natural log of the number of days of arranging the things things in your collection. Oh, that also includes <coughs> um, the entropy was a measure of how much random motion was in something. Also, the number of ways of arranging things. And that supposes the natural log of that count. It's really just a statistical count. And this digression is going to apply to this in a second, in a bit. And I'll kind of take you through the, the concept. <coughs> uh, let's see. Um, turns out. Turns out, if you think about it, there's really just two ways of increasing the entropy of a fixed amount of stuff. So we got to fix the amount of stuff because you can't go taking any away or putting any in. Now, reactions, chemical reactions occur, you know, when you can change the amount of stuff, and then you have this teeter totter of, you know, something brings entropy in and something takes entropy out, and there's this balance. Let me just write for a fixed amount of stuff, there's two ways of increasing the entropy. The entropy is related to the number of ways of arranging stuff, and it also kind of includes a little 
thermal wiggling that can occur. Let me give you the model again of, of, of a solid. Uh, say we take the four, first 40 seats here, that's, uh, that's about five rows in this, and we put 40 of you in these um, 40 seats all packed together. Okay, you're a crystal. You're a solid crystal at that point because you're all orderly. The number of ways of arranging you is pretty much set. You're, you're indistinguishable, so it doesn't matter if you swap, but you can wiggle in your seat. You wiggle in your seat, there's a little temperature, and you wiggle in your seat, but you're locked in these positions. So that's the crystal in solid. And if I add temperature, I put a little energy in by raising your temperature, you wiggle in your seat a little bit more. And so you would decrease the, the energy by um, um, just, and there's only 40 seats available. And let's say that I have a partition here and you can't get to those seats. Now eventually, now eventually if I put in enough energy, you'll wiggle in your seats, but then you'll go and get up to some of those up there. That's as if you melted. So now you're melting and you kind of diffuse up to the seats up there. And now you got more ways of arranging things because there's some new seats available. Then, if I really get it high enough, you can overcome a barrier I put in. Maybe it's only that high. And then you can spread out all in here. Now you're a gas. And as a gas, you could get that way by raising the temp. Or, or if I say, well, now you can occupy these seats and those seats, and there's enough energy to do it, without raising the temperature, I can say, take the partition out of this thing and make those seats available. Okay, so I really just told you what the two ways of raising the entropy is. One, one, increase the temperature. And what that does is it, um, it increases the uh, random motion. And um, so if I increase the temperature, even of a solid, you can wiggle more. Increases the entropy. Um, or you can diffuse into bigger space, become like a liquid, you know, that that has a little higher entropy than a solid, or become a gas. So putting all those increases in the temp can, can increase the random motion. Now that's the one you knew already. This is the one you actually knew already for any process, delta S is Q over P, which was the constant volume heat capacity delta T times T average. Um, um, that, one, that one, you know, you, you put in temperature, you increase the random motion. But now, suppose I have the bodies in these seats as a gas, but I have a partition right here that's a wall, and it's almost like a stopcock if you're in a volume of gas. And I open the stopcock, and suddenly these seats are made available. What did that really just do? It increased the entropy by not changing the temperature, but So at constant temperature, if I just increase the volume that something has to run around in, I increase the entropy. Um, and so increase the volume. So how do you increase the entropy of anything? You either can, you can increase the temperature, even at fixed volume, that means everything's moving around way more. Or I can keep the temperature fixed with a thermostat at that. Uh, 
keep the temperature fixed and just let there be more volume to explore. So this idea of increasing the entropy of something by increasing the volume it has to explore is an important one and it drives a lot of processes. That just means by having more space to fill, um, that will increase the entropy of the universe. We say that nature abhors a vacuum. It tries to fill a vacuum with stuff. Um, for example. Um, so, so this one you sort of knew and we talked about this. This one's somewhat of a new idea, but I think if you think about it, you go, yeah, that'll, 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 that'll increase the number of ways of doing stuff because you got more ways of being, more chairs available. Okay, so with the idea that the entropy of something will increase, which is always a, a, a good direction as far as the universe is concerned, the idea that the entropy will increase by just increasing the volume it has to roam around in can, can, could conceivably drive a process. Um, well, if I, if I have a, a solution on the left of molarity, with the molarity of B, and I have pure water over here, what might you think then would happen? Well, if pure water goes this way, um, if pure water goes through the membrane, it actually increases the volume on the left. And if it increases the volume on the left, B has more room to run around. So, um, through the membrane to the left. And it increases the volume B has to occupy. Um, and so what kind of prop and um, so that's a that's an that's an entropy increaser. is entropy of B increases <coughs> as the as water flows to the left, the entropy of the B will increase. And you think, well, will that go on forever? You know, would that go on forever? And well you gotta think, well wait, on the right over here, on the right over here we're sort of decreasing the entropy of the water on the right. Because if we kind of think about the pure stuff, its volume is decreasing, so um, so now the volume on the left increases too. So the, the entropy of the water on the left is increasing also because we're getting uh, more of it on the left uh, and then occupying a bigger volume, but. But the entropy of the water on the right is decreasing. Because uh, the entropy of the water on, on the right, well, it's going that way. You're losing some, the volume's diminishing. So the entropy there is going down. Well, eventually, then, these will balance. Water will flow from the pure into the solution to dilute it until there's a point where the increase in entropy of B is canceled by the decrease in entropy um, of the water on the right. So, at equilibrium, this will come to a stop when the levels 
are different. This is still pure uh, water, and this is H2O and a molality of B. Right? And those, those, those levels are different. Now we can work, we could then work this out in terms of free energy, and uh, you can actually derive what is changed here. And what's different here is this level difference is called pi, the osmotic pressure. Um, and what, what happened is some amount of work was done. Some amount of work was done to raise that. This level of water went like that. So you could actually calculate that energy. That must have been the free energy. And then you can calculate via entropy changes, uh, do the bookkeeping, and derive an expression for this difference. And it turns out that it is Pressure difference then that at that height um, is the osmotic pressure. the unit of the gas constant. So let's, let's actually think, well, suppose we make a sugar solution, and suppose we make that sugar solution maybe, how about a tenth of a molar, 0.1 molar? For a sugar solution that is 0.1 what if I write it out? There's 0.1 molar. Why don't we figure out how, how big is this? How big is that pressure? How much is that pressure? Somebody pop up those <coughs> numbers, 0 0.1 times 0 0.0821 times 98. It's 2.4. 2.4. 2.4. That's what I get. Um, 2.4 atmospheres. Um, so that means that this um, pressure exerted up is 
four atmospheres. Well, let's see. How, how big a column of water is that? Could you multiply Could you multiply 2.4 times 760 millimeters of mercury? One thousand eight hundred twenty-four. A thousand eight hundred twenty-four. Yeah, let's just do that. Um, now, now that's one point eight meters of mercury. Well, mercury is thirteen times more dense. So let's actually realize that that pressure um, this is the density ratio grams per um, grams per milliliter grams per milliliter of um, mercury Mercury is 13 times as dense, so that means the column of mercury could be supported as 1.8 meters. The column of water that could be supported is 13 times as big. Could you do 13 times that? 13 times 1,800? 23,400. Were, um, if this were a tenth molar sugar, that the height of that water above this one would be 23 meters. Uh, that's around 25 feet. Um, that's up. That's up to the actual to the ceiling. Is the column of water that would ex would exhibit this much pressure? And that that's really fairly high. What that what this means is. Not much solute. You only need like 10 to minus 3 molar. You could repeat this for not 0.1 molar, but 10 to minus 3 molar. Um, you'll get a significant height difference at a real dilute solution, um, which means that you can kind of reverse the process and uh, calculate the molar mass doing it this way, and instead of trying to measure a, a half a degree, like freezing point depression, um, you're actually measuring, you know, whole meter of water column to do that measurement. I'll, I'll finish on this next time, but you can actually make this process go this way by observing a pressure greater than this, will force pure water out this end. And that's called the